I think it's about time to get started. Welcome everyone. I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of CNI and uh, you've arrived at one of the project briefing sessions at our um, spring 2020 virtual meeting. Uh, that meeting will run through the end of May, so plenty more still to come. Um, thank you for joining us. We're going to have a wonderful presentation with five speakers today, um, and I'll talk about that in just a moment um, and then turn it over to them. We will take questions at the end. Um, note that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and feel free to, um, to enter questions as they occur to you at any point during the presentation. Uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will uh, materialize and um, moderate the Q&A. Um, uh, but please do, you know, put in questions as they occur to you. Now, let me turn to introduce the session at hand. Um, I'm really delighted to have this um, session. Uh, as we know, um, research data management is one of the um, really fundamental problems that's facing our institutions today. Um, it is both a partnership and a challenge uh, thrown out by the funding agencies um, who are placing a greater and greater emphasis on this. And um, it's also very much a consequence of trends toward open scholarship and open science. Um, some of you uh, probably were able to participate in the workshop that followed the December CNI meeting, and um, a number of the speakers here were very involved in that. Um, and I think, among other things, they will be reporting on some of the outcomes of that work. Um, I think without further ado, I will turn it over to Judy Ruttenberg from uh, ARL, who will um, uh, speak first, introduce the topic, and uh, our other speakers will introduce themselves as um, they, uh, they take their turns. So all that I have left to do is say thank you very much to our speakers for this presentation, and thank you for joining us. Over to you, Judy. Thank you. Um, thank you to CNI um, for having this um, extraordinary conference in this way. Um, and thank, thanks to all of you uh, for tuning in for our presentation. Um, so like Cliff said, I'm Judy Rutenberg. I'm the Senior Director of Program Strategy at the Association of Research Libraries. And I'm jo joined um, today by four amazing colleagues and they will introduce themselves um, as we move through the presentation. So in May of 2019, a year, just one year ago, uh, the National Science Foundation issued a Dear Colleague letter uh, describing and encouraging grantees to adopt two data practices, uh, assigning persistent identifiers or PIDs to data sets and creating machine actionable, machine readable data management plans. <clears throat> this guidance was significant in that it reflected the maturity and acceptance of these practices within the research data community, um, notably the Research Data Alliance, Force 11, um, and the leadership of tool builders and service providers in both of these areas. So ARL partnered uh, with the California Digital Library, uh, who you'll hear from very shortly, and as well as the Association of American Universities and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. And we received funding from, from NSF to hold a conference to design implementation guidelines for institutions around this Dear Colleague letter. Uh, and it was really a dream team uh, to work with. ARL uh, and the partnership made all kinds of sense. Um, from ARL's perspective, it, was in our, it is in our action plan, um, the objective to advance open science by design. AAU and APLU have been convening institutions uh, around accelerating public access to research data since 2018. And our colleagues at CDL are tool builders, uh, experts, community builders um, in, all, in both of these, uh, these important areas. And then we also recruited Natalie Myers, who you'll hear from this afternoon for her leadership and involvement um, 
in RDA and specifically around these issues. So as Cliff said, we held the conference adjacent to the winter CNI meeting uh, in DC. So just to acknowledge the full organizing committee for the project um, and a shout out to uh, Joel Kutcher Gershenfeld for his extraordinary facilitation, uh, workshop design and live note taking. So we had about 40 people uh, attend the conference, but which was by invitation. Uh, they represented, they were uh, librarians, including deans, uh, research administrators, tool builders, uh, funders, and researchers, and association people. Uh, we also chose about 15 invitees, um, some of whom couldn't be in attendance because of other conflicts, uh, to interview beforehand. And we asked sort of two simple questions in those interviews. Um, the first was what was what is the value um, that they saw in adopting PIDs for data sets and machine readable data management plans? And then two, what are the challenges or barriers to their adoption? So, I mean, I think what we learned in the interviews as well as the conference itself is how well established the value proposition for these data practices is. So with persistent IDs, um, we heard they would advance uh, discovery, disambiguation, um, enable credit for data creation, for reuse, uh, tracking, linking, and connecting pieces of uh, a project or scholarship, um, helping to automate compliance within the institution around funding, uh, funding mandates, uh, and then for reproducibility in meta science. So we heard all of that as, uh, as a value proposition. For machine readable data management plans, we heard uh, their value in communication and progress reporting to the funder within the institution, um, et, et cetera, uh, to program officers, uh, and repository planning, particularly with respect to you know, data type and storage amount, things like that, um, campus planning for uh, compute services, um, a lot about syncing up with the publication process so that the the issue of linking um, data with publications, um, look, knowing about data that might have some risk um, with respect to personal information or privacy or the like, um, and uh, transparency and accountability. So we also heard about challenges. Um, so we kind of went into the, the conference knowing this. Um, for persistent IDs, a lack of awareness among investigators that they had to get them, did they need them, who, you know, who was responsible for that, um, confusion around granularity, what particularly around data, uh, at what point um, are identifiers issued, uh, you know, for a growing data set. Um, again, the communication between data repositories and publishers and the need for a stronger linkage there. And the concern over sustainability, not just of PIDs, the numbers, but the sustainability of the organizations as, um, as infrastructure for scholarship. And uh, for data management plans, challenges, um, similarly, lack of awareness of tools um, to create machine readable data management plans. Um, lots of concern around uh, investigator or researcher burden. Nobody wants to add to that. Um, and uh, centrally, I think that data management plans are part of a grant application. So right off the bat, they're PDFs. Um, they're sort of submitted through uh, old, potentially software. Um, for managing those grants and uh, workflows within institutions are local by nature and idiosyncratic and therefore sort of hard to um, design guidelines that would be universally applicable around them. Um, and then the sort of cultural or policy issue that data management plans are neither public nor typically shared widely even within the institution. Um, so, you know, here's a quick five takeaways from the conference before we uh, dive deep into uh, PIDs and DMPs. Um, the first one was to center the researcher. There was an absolute consensus or shared understanding that researchers need to see whatever guidelines we come out with um, as, uh, to be, uh, as to be worth it for this to have any legitimacy. They need to be at the center of our thinking and our models, and we need to design tools and guidelines and things around their workflows and not expect the reverse. So the guidelines that we issue 
as a result of this conference, will endeavor to really disambiguate researcher needs and contributions um, to, you know, to say the DMP process from the needs and responsibilities of the research support services. Um, conference participants focused on and articulated the need to, for greater alignment between disciplinary specialists and the library community, domain repositories, library stewards. Um, so our guidelines will encourage more conversation between library repositories and domain repositories, um, particularly at the point at which data management plans are finalized um, and data sort of transfers stewardship. Um, the implementation guidelines will also encourage and support support and or advocacy for the organizations that sustain persistent identifiers uh, registries as essential pieces of scholarly infrastructure, um, as well as open licensing of metadata that enables interoperability across systems. Uh, unbundle the DMP. There is a sense that we may be overloading the data management plan with too many expectations, too many roles in terms of communication and compliance and um, lab management and scientific merit. And uh, the implement, so we have take from this that our guidelines will support uh, versioned, updatable living data management plans by encouraging multiple stages of DMP creation, sharing and iterating, um, and that with its eventual integration um, into the grant progress report. Um, and finally, uh, kids will unlock discovery. We heard a lot of that in the interviews and then within, um, you know, a lot of commitment to that uh, within the conference itself. And our final report will, um, we will uh, provide tangible examples of that data integration across repositories um, through PIDS. But here to talk to you about PIDS is Maria Gould from the California Digital Library. Thanks, Judy. Hi, everyone. I am Maria Gould, and I am at California Digital Library, where I work at the uh, University of California Curation Center, or UC3 team, which is our um, program within CDL focused on digital curation. And my, my role within that team is working on CDL's persistent identifiers portfolio. So I'm here at this juncture in the talk today to kind of take a step back and contextualize this discussion in the broader landscape of persistent identifiers. So I have three minutes to give you the 30,000 foot view of everything that's happening in the world of PIDS right now. So uh, easy, right? Uh, so I, I do a few things at, at CDL that I, with PIDS that I wanted to mention just because I, I think they really tie into what I'm gonna talk about in terms of what's going on in, in the PID landscape. So I work as the service manager for CDL's Easy ID service, which provides DOI services for our University of California libraries, as well as DOI and ARC services for the broader community. I'm also the project lead for the Research Organization Registry, which is a project aimed at developing new open infrastructure for research organization identifiers. And I'm also more broadly involved in the larger PID community through initiatives like the Pidapalooza conference where we're bringing stakeholders together from, uh, from all around the world and in various uh, types, of, uh, types of communities to talk about uh, what's going on with PIDs and kind of how our activities intersect. So I think what's going on in, in the landscape these days and when we talk about the landscape uh, of persistent identifiers, especially in the context of research data management and, and open and online scholarship more broadly, we're talking about a few different landscapes or, or a few different layers at once. And I'm trying to illustrate that with these images on, on the slide here. And one layer of that landscape kind of illustrated in the far left is just this core focus on what exactly do we need to identify? What PIDs do we need for all of the things? There are PIDs that are more well known and familiar to our communities like DOIs for articles and data sets and preprints and ORCID identifiers for researchers, for the people involved in research. Uh, 
IDs that are now more emergent, uh, like the research organization registries, ROAR IDs, um, and a whole wider landscape uh, of new and emerging uh, or more established identifiers for grants, for instruments, for facilities, for samples, for conferences, projects, and, and much more. So there's this huge jumble of persistent identifiers out there right now. And, oh, sorry, Judy, can you go back? Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, and kind of represented in the in the middle Im image is is this question or this layer of uh, the systems and the tools and the structures and workflows that we need to to make sense of that of that jumble uh, and the standards that we use for how to organize them. And then the last layer, kind of illustrated in the far right, is how we connect all of these things together and how we get people on board uh, with with adoption uh, and implementation, so we can really achieve meaningful insights about the research process and the broader impacts and so you know this sense of it's really not enough to just have a PID or even a set of PIDs they need to be connected to each other and they need to be used and so a large part of that is technical and a large part of that is also not technical it's about uh, the communities that we're reaching out to it's about the awareness and outreach that is needed to make people aware of it furthermore it's also about who who doesn't necessarily need to know about a persistent identifier. In other words, how we can make some of these connections and networks more seamless uh, and invisible to really minimize friction, to minimize the burden on researchers or the burden on, you know, dumping everything into a DMP, uh, as, as Judy was just talking about. So how we can really maximize the ease of uptake by minimizing some of that friction. Uh, so can you go on to the next slide? Thanks. So the, uh, you know, what does this mean in terms of how uh, that landscape, uh, those different layers can really be used to network, uh, to, you know, to be networked uh, in the research process to really unlock discovery. And I'm just sort of reflecting uh, on the previous slide in a slightly different way here and thinking through, obviously the core of this is, is the PIDs themselves, the DOIs, the ORCIDs, ROAR IDs, et cetera. But just having those identifiers really doesn't do anything on its own. And so there's this next layer uh, in this network of, of the workflows and the standards and, and structures that are needed to, to knit them together uh, to, you know, to really make, uh, make sense of it. And then there's kind of this additional outer layer of, of where it all goes. You know, for instance, if there's a data publishing workflow or a publishing workflow in which all of these different PIDs are being collected, uh, they need to be indexed somewhere in an open, uh, open index like Crossref or Datasite so that all of that metadata can be queried so that systems can connect to those indexes and bring the insights downstream uh, to support better search and discovery and better insights overall about uh, the shape and the nature and the impact of the research. So those are a few of the opportunities and challenges and, and, and nuanced kind of layers that are underway in the persistent identifier landscape that I think really connect to some of the values as well as the challenges that are coming through in the course of this workshop and, and the broader effort that this workshop reflects. So with that, I will turn it over to how this is playing out in the world of uh, data management plans and machine actionable DMPs. Thanks, Maria. Uh, so my name is Maria Pretzelis. I am the other Maria on the UC3 team at CDL. So I work in research data management initiatives, um, primarily with the DMP tool, which I'm sure most folks are familiar with. Um, it, this tool has been around for almost 10 years. It's been very successful, it has very wide adoption in the community. We've got over 46,000 users, 43,000 data management plans. And really our focus kind of development wise at this point is to really focus on creating kind of next generation machine actionable data management plans. So I'm gonna give you kind of an update on where we are with that and talk about one specific pilot project that we have um, uh, to share with you. So Judy, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we have an NSF funded eager grant uh, right now to really to explore the potential of machine actionable DMPs um, really as a means to transform DMPs to that compliance um, 
uh, exercise, the static text documents that Judy was referring to that we're all aware of, into this networked research data management ecosystem um, with really the, the broad goal to improve the research process for everyone, for all stakeholders that are involved in that system. Um, and a key question really underlying our work um, connects to what Maria Gould was just talking about, oh, how to really make the connections within that PID graph, within the um, identifier ecosystem. So adding data management plans into that um, through the use of uh, persistent identifiers. So our first step with that was to put in as many um, identifiers as we can into the DMP tool. Um, we did partner with DataCite to prototype minting um, persistent identifiers, um, DOIs for DMPs. Um, we're using that kind of as an anchor to uh, collect changes to the DMP over time that Judy had mentioned again. Um, we're using uh, the uh, data site event data so uh, service to keep everybody update, all of the uh, players in uh, up to date on changes to a research project over time as it progresses. We go to the next slide, please. So a specific um, project that we have to kind of pilot out this work with machine actionable DMPs um, is our real world use case, um, really, which leverages um, and tests out um, our work to make DMPs machine actionable. We call it the Fair Island Project. Um, and uh, it leverages collaboration between the University of California Gump Field Station, which is in French Polynesia, and the Tetaroa Society. Um, and Techeroa is an atoll in French Polynesia. It's kind of in between the island of Moria and Tahiti. It is absolutely stunningly beautiful um, tropical paradise. Um, it's also a really excellent spot to test out kind of a lot of the principles that we're talking about today. Um, so because it's a very, um, you know, the Techeroa Society has control over all of the research that's conducted or collected on the island, um, we really are able to demonstrate how we can advance open science by creating the optimal fair data policies that govern all of the research that is conducted on that island, um, on that field station. So that includes uh, mandatory registration requirements, um, controlled vocabularies, all the persistent identifiers that we can find that are appropriate. Um, and so DMPs kind of in this environment, in this project are really the key infrastructure that allows us to track provenance, um, attribution, compliance, checking with those optimal data policies, and ultimately publication for all of the research data that was collected on the island. Um, so our question here really is, can we, can we build a model system that allows this data to be fed across the stakeholder system using um, persistent identifiers that Maria was talking about? Should you go to the next slide, please? So we are starting with the Tetaroa um, field station um, in the South Pacific. And then our hope is to kind of extend the policies and the infrastructure that we've developed um, in this partnership to other field stations that are administered by the University of California, uh, the Natural Reserve System, which is another kind of key partner in this project. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, we hope to demonstrate really the specific capabilities of machine actionable plans in this very kind of bounded um, specific use case um, and to analyze the downstream effects of these policies. Um, in the resulting release of data. So does it actually, in, in fact, speed up the time to uh, release of data? We could go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to end um, on this slide, just kind of demonstrating all of the identifiers that we are utilizing to really record the assertions to uh, DMP DOI so that we're able to track a project as it moves forward over time. Um, so using the Fair Island project, we're really trying to test out the flow of this information to integrate with as many external systems and information systems to really track how this uh, information can uh, record data management activities as they occur during the course of a grant project. Um, so I'm really looking forward to sharing our continued results um, as we proceed with this project and encourage and you know, increasingly add more machine actionability to the DMP tool. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Fair Island Project and our work in this area, you can go to our project website, uh, which is just 
fairisland.org. And with that, I will pass it over to Natalie. Hi, thank you, Mother Maria. I appreciated hearing more about Fair Island. That project is so exciting. Um, I wanted to take this moment um, to describe to those of us attending a little bit more about the context of stakeholders in the December workshop and particularly the participation of funders and others so important to enabling us to have machine actionable data management plans and to understand the different stakeholder ways that we engage with data management plan content. Um, in this slide that we're sharing now, um, I'd like to um, bring your attention to a pre-conference interview that I had the good fortune to conduct with Ben Pearson and Ashley Farley from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, if uh, Judy, you could um, take us into uh, hearing a little bit from um, Ben about what we can do right now, I'd sure appreciate it. Thanks, Judy. We, we've been more and more thinking about this in Brian Nosick's, you know, triangle of, of change and adoption, um, where, you know, we need to make it possible for people to do this, for those early adopters that want to do this and do it right. We also need to actually get to easy as well. You know, normative is going to be tough, but like that, that well, let's not jump ahead yet. Let's just make it possible and, and easy. Um, and right now, I mean, we've experienced even in just making an output, whether it's a data management plan, pick a thing, right? We, we have these great results coming out of the knowledge integration work. And normally you'd produce a paper and at an abstract, but that actually isn't the output that is ultimately machine readable in the way that we want. So we've had to figure out how do you make a machine readable output? Well, today on a data management plan, it's just free text in our investment system. So there's no guidance on how to actually make that machine readable. What really, what's the structure, et cetera. So I think it would be actually, like we wanna get down to that level. Um, and so uh, while we're, you know, my life for the last year has been a lot of uh, convenings and conferences of, of varying levels of uh, action and reality around uh, FAIR um, and turning assets into, reusable assets into value. Um, I'm counting on this being at a level of uh, specificity and actionability that I can take back, even if it's not the full thing, but to take back to say, this is what we can do right now in our guidance, in our policies, to make it better for uh, program officers and grantees uh, getting research grants to make sure that their outputs are in fact persistent and machine readable. Thanks, Judy. Um, I hope that helps everybody understand a little bit more the perspective of a funding agency that runs on um, the mission of impatient optimism. I'm happy to share with everyone that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has incorporated many of the takeaways from our workshop into their requirements and their asset classes that will um, be followed by those participating in their therapeutics accelerator program uh, related to COVID-19. So I think that's a very um, promising way to look at how a stakeholder like Ben and the foundation can engage in an ARL, AAU, APLU workshop and come away with something actionable that lets them go back with policy ideas, with ways of implementing them and an understanding of broader community um, needs and goals. We'll move forward now, Judy, if we could to our next slide. This slide shares some information and pull quotes from Dina Paltu at um, NIH. And Dina's interview prior to the workshop was really interesting because it came at the time where NIH was getting ready to do a request for public comments on their draft NIH policy for data management and sharing. 
NIH recognizes that sharing scientific data advances NIH's stewardship of taxpayer funds, but also maximizes research participants' contributions. They know that increasing access to scientific data resulting from NIH-funded or conducted research advances biomedical research by enabling the validation of scientific results, by allowing analyses to be strengthened by combining data, by facilitating reuse of hard to generate data, and by accelerating future research. So that's the context in which Dina and I were speaking on the day that we did this interview. And when I asked Dina about the value of machine-readable data management plans, um, she uh, directed the conversation toward how she thought this was really important because it fosters connection. It allows, it creates some consistency. It allows for the ability for investigators to be able to update their data management plan so that everything can be linked and connected. The data can be attached to whatever the award is, but it can also be attached to the data management plan itself so that that plan can be followed appropriately. And then others who would like to be able to find and use the data know more about where it would, came from and how it was governed. This is part and parcel of how in the recent draft guideline from NIH, they're proposing that reasonable, allowable costs can be included in NIH budget requests when associated with, number one, curating data and developing supporting documentation, number two, preserving and sharing data through established repositories, and number three, local data management considerations, such as unique and specialized information infrastructure necessary to provide local management, preservation, and access to data. Budget estimates can include all three of those categories now in NIH, and researchers are encouraged to do that as they prepare their data management plan. Could we move on, Judy, to our next stakeholder? Here we hear from Margaret Levenstein from ICPSR. Could you play Margaret's video for us, Judy? And you can imagine um, uh, a data management plan being used um, by a funder to say, okay, this is what you promised to do. Can I go back and verify that you actually did it? Um, I can if there's a persistent identifier, which is associated with the repository where you said it was going to go, right? So these things interact. Um, so the, I'm just there. There are things that you could imagine a journal when you publish in a journal that they want to look at the data management plan to make sure that what you're doing is consistent. If you said I in the data management plan the data are confidential, then the journal might believe that the data are confidential. If you said in the data management plan oh yes, give me money to do this research and, and I will share the data. But when the, you go to the journal, they you say, oh, I can't share my data, it's confidential. That, you know, that there's actually some transparency in this whole thing, right? So um, on the other hand, um, and again, you can give the journal persistent identifiers, these things all reinforce one another. So there, there are, um, so there's some accountability measures built into a, a, a data management plan that are, if it's machine actionable, that are really much harder to leverage um, if it's a PDF which is stored someplace that nobody can see. I think we'd all agree um, that Maggie points out something that um, is frustrating to people who want to reuse um, data that they see um, referred to in published papers, and also something that frustrates funders um, who expect shared outputs and don't always get them. Can we move on to our next slide, Judy? Here we hear from CNI Director Cliff Lynch a little bit about um, stakeholders for machine actionable DMP content. So let's hear from Cliff. Certainly for awarded grants, the data management plans and probably the grants themselves um, need to be considerably more um, public within the institution. Um, uh, they need to be objects that the mm -hmm. library and the IT folks mm -hmm. have ongoing access to um, because everybody has a stake in this. The researchers themselves, offices 
um, grants and sponsored projects and the compliance side of that. Um, the library, uh, who's going to be helping with curation potentially. Um, uh, the IT folks, um, particularly if the uh, data management plan, for example, is revised to call for uh, larger amounts of storage for some reason. They may need to know about that. Thanks, Judy. So here we hear from Cliff about who some of the stakeholders are in machine actionable DMP content and some of the reasons for why um, they might need to interact with that content or have a stake in how it's reused. If we move on to our next slide, we can hear a little bit more about a project in the Research Data Alliance uh, within the Research Data Alliance Exposing Data Management Plans Working Group. I'm going to share to you in the chat a link to the Exposing Data Management Plans uh, working group page and also a link to a call for contribution related to uh, the research data alliance exposing data management plan working group uh, request for comments on exposing data management plans um, this working group has been running over two years at the Research Data Alliance. It's a free grassroots consortium of stakeholders in research data. It's an international consortium. Anyone can join for free. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about the Research Data Alliance, I encourage you to go to rd-alliance.org. And there you'll find a way to uh, both join the association if you're not a member of the Research Data Alliance already, um, but more importantly, to explore the terrific work being conducted in its working group and interest groups. In the RDA Exposing Data Management Plans group, um, we drafted recommendations covering five main points, resulting in 12 recommendations, about specific elements of data management plans and how they benefit stakeholders when they're shared and reused. Those five main points cover fair DMPs for fair data production, ethical exposure of data management plan content, standardized metadata for DMPs, controlled vocabularies in DMPs, and persistent identifiers in DMPs and for DMPs. We'd appreciate everyone's input to these recommendations, both where you think we've hit the mark and where you think we've missed it, and where you think our recommendations could be improved, or where we might need better examples and use cases. Um, this recommendation and its concurrent request for comments gets right at the heart of each of the stakeholder groups Cliff mentioned and harks back to everything we heard about funder, publisher, and re researcher stakeholder views related to how data management plan content can be shared in a, a machine actionable um, DMP environments. Um, so please come, submit your input, and we hope to hear more from you and find ways that through all our consortial efforts, the culture of data reuse and interoperability will be accelerated so that research can be found successfully and in a method that is something we can trust, taken up by researchers internationally in a more seamless way in the future. I thank you for your attention, and now I'm going to pass it on to my colleague. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, I'm, my name is Jenny Mullenberg, and I'm Research Data Services Librarian at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I'm also a visiting program officer with ARL focused on research data. And I'm going to tell you, now that you've gotten a lot of the background and context, I'm going to say a little bit more specifically about the meeting that happened in December and what our next steps and draft recommendations are going to be. 
So the participants at that in that meeting, um, we had both a series of panels and kind of rotating group discussions, and everything was focused around primarily these groups that you see listed here, uh, different stakeholder groups. So libraries, the funders, publishers, researchers, research offices, and tool builders. And so um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what the group is doing next and how you can both see that work and provide comment. So Judy, if you could go to the next slide, please. We will be working to um, come up with a set of draft recommendations and that information will be presented via webinar so that people can make comments on the work that we've done. And this work will also be contributing to the AAU APLU guide for accelerating public access to research data. And um, I, the link to that report is there on the slide and then also a link to the December meeting agenda so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about when I mentioned the panels and the workshops itself. So Judy, if you could go to the next slide. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we are working together to create these recommendations. And I'm gonna use the library group, um, stakeholder group as an example. So we took the copious pages of notes from our workshop and tried to distill them down into each one of the stakeholder groups. And then for each group, we worked to identify a problem statement, any missing pieces that were um, identified in this, uh, the environment of research data, and then an actionable agenda for each one of the groups. So next slide, please. So as an example for the library group, the problem statement included, um, you know, there were lots of things that kind of fell into three primary buckets, and you, know, you see those here. So one of the things that was identified is that the existing library expertise in PIDs and DMPs and data management needs greater visibility. There are you know, pockets where it has good visibility and pockets where it's missing, and we talked about how to kind of surface that expertise on a more uh, even playing field. We also identified a lack of centralized funding, and again, that kind of refers to some places where it um, gets more support than others, but with a lack of centralized funding, it's hard to make it sort of a universal attempt at adoption. And then a lack of standardization on use of PIDs and DMPs and data management, both within disciplines and within um, different departments on campuses. Next slide. So for this, we tried to identify some of the missing pieces. And in that list, everything pointed to two main things, and that was more collaboration and more coordination among various campus partners. And the main goal of that collaboration and coordination would be to elevate use of the existing services and, and also the infrastructure that would be used to support that use. And so the next step in that is to identify an actionable agenda. So using the library as an example again, we identified that library and stakeholder partnerships are essential to develop institutional policies on data management and sharing. And this extends to include institu institutional expectations for DMPs and PIDs. More visibility, be, visibility around what is expected at the institutional policy level will help um, greater adoption for both PIDs and DMPs. And then to help identify the library as the primary point of contact for DMP and PID expertise, infrastructure, education, and training. Next slide, yeah. Oh, there we are. <laughs> so we wanted to provide an opportunity for everyone to discuss uh, the things they saw on the slide and to ask any questions. We also wanted to thank everyone for attending. Um, and th I wanted to thank all my co-presenters as well and CNI for the opportunity pr to present. At thank this point, you. oh yeah, I was gonna say you can type um, questions into the chat as well. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Jennifer, and thanks to all of our panelists for reporting on your work. Um, really important and very interesting project that you've been working on and devoted a lot of time and energy to. We really loved hearing about that. And I'm sure we have a lot of questions from our attendees. I just want to introduce myself. I'm Diane Goldenberg Hart with the Coalition for Networked Information. Um, this webinar is part of CNI's ongoing Spring 2020 virtual meeting, which will continue through the end of May. And at this time, I would like to invite our attendees to type in your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we will field those live 
Uh, if you have any comments or questions, if you want to find out more about the process, about how to implement some of these strategies, please go ahead and share those with us now. While we're waiting to see if we've got some questions coming in, I just want to go ahead and share with you in the chat box there um, a direct link to our spring meeting schedule. We've got lots of more webinars to come in the next few weeks, including another one following this panel on statistical consulting in the library. I also want to mention that if you have a comment that you'd like to make uh, live, or if you would like to um, engage directly with any of our panelists, you can raise your virtual hand and I can turn on uh, your, I can unmute you and you can interact directly with our panelists. Um, one of the advantages of this um, environment. So to our panelists, where, where are we going to next from, from here? Do you have any thoughts on next steps here? Maybe Judy? Sure, uh, thanks Diane. So yeah, as um, so Jenny kind of previewed, um, I think where our draft recommendations are going and because we could only have, you know, there's a limit how many people you can put in a room and there are hundreds of people who could have been in that room in December crafting, you know, go, doing this work and we're grateful for the people who were, but we wanna really engage everyone who wasn't as well. So the idea is to, it was a preview of what the recommend of, of, of the process by which we'll come up with recommendations and then those will be made um, you know we'll, we'll uh, push those out um, to various constituencies uh, you know with Google Forms and things for comment um, and that will that will take place we'll be doing that later this month in May you know have an open comment period um, you know for a while in the early summer um, and uh, you know get the recommend get the uh, draft guidelines, these implementation guidelines out, um, you know, toward the fall. Um, and then, of course, you know, wrap the entire project will have a report um, to the National Science Foundation. Great. So watch for those on various, and we'll, you know, we'll certainly use CNI um, as a communication channel. <laughs> yeah, that. We'll push those out. Right. Thank you. And it looks like Natalie wanted to jump in there, too. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to jump in there. Um, to um, share that one way we hope um, that we'll be able to share these outcomes is in the RDA um, request for comments on the um, exposing data management plan elements. Um, we hope to have those recommendations adopted at the next RDA plenary in about four months time. So the output of this workshop and the recommendations of its stakeholders can feed into that process in a very meaningful way. So we're really thrilled about um, how they serendipitously occurred at the same time. Um, the other thing I'd like to respond to is the um, question in the Q&A from um, Tim McGeary. Um, who asked, um, what are the ways um, we've seen any real-time impact of the um, work we've been doing during COVID-19? And he asked if there are any opportunities from this crisis to uh, take advantage of. And um, I think that one place I've seen a lot of activity around this is again in the Research Data Alliance and its COVID-19 working group. Within that effort, um, over 400 volunteers are working together to create rapid guidelines for people doing COVID-19 research in order to quickly do interoperable data sharing in this Wild West environment where um, some work may be funded, some may not, some may be being conducted by governments, some by funded projects, um, some by academic research consortia and so on. And it's very important for people internationally to be able to collaborate quickly. We've seen a lot of these same recommendations um, percolate up 
through examples people are taking from the NIH data sharing guidelines, um, from their funders at funders uh, in the open research funders group like Welcome and Gates, mm -hmm. and from the kind of presentations and uh, explanations that were shared at our workshop and others like it, um, I think that there's a sea change in the curiosity and interest of researchers to find the best repositories, find the best data sharing methods, find the right PID and find it quickly so their data can be taken up. And I think that impatience is a wonderful thing. And also um, one of the phrases I loved um, related to the COVID-19 work was that um, we know we don't have time to go back and do it right again later. We know we have to do it right the first time. So it behooves us to follow these draft guidelines from NIH, these draft guidelines um, from groups like RDA, these suggestions and stakeholder topics of workshop uh, participants like at our workshop in December, because they're the best we have right now and the best chance we've got at um, reusable data. So I really appreciate that question. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Natalie, and uh, thanks, Tim, for the question. And Cliff, uh, Cliff has a question for you as well. Can you give us any sense of how the idea of machine actionable and regularly updated DMPs is being received by researchers? I can take that one. Um, when uh, building out these features for the DMP tool, one of my goals has been to make it pretty seamless so researchers don't notice. Um, kind of like what Maria was saying, like this is really the back end infrastructure that when done right is not an extra burden on anyone. In fact, it should make things faster and easier. It should make information uh, flow better so you don't have to enter the same data in five different systems. It can kind of all be connected. So ultimately, it should save people time and make things uh, much easier. So I don't think that your average researcher really needs to know much about machine actionable data management plans. Um, it should really be something that um, makes their lives um, easier and makes reporting easier. Going back to a funder, you can see all of the um, steps that your project has gone through and you have documentation about where things are. So ultimately, I think the response has been pretty positive as long as we keep that goal of making things easy for people and not giving them one more thing to have to, what's the PID and how does this relate? And, you know, it should really be something that is um, pretty seamless for folks. Right. We don't want to know how to make the car run. We just want it to run. <laughs> so. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Just Thanks. make it work. Right. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? Terrific. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in right now. And um, so I think with that, I'm going to propose uh, closing down the recording portion, in other words, the public portion of this webinar with uh, tremendous thanks to our panelists for coming to CNI to talk about this and also to our attendees for spending time um, with us today. And I just wanna let our attendees know if you wanna hang around, uh, the panelists will uh, stay for a bit. And um, after I turn off the recording, we'd love to have you uh, sort of approach the podium and uh, ask a question or make a comment or just share your ideas about um, these processes and um, and these the needs within this community. So thanks once again to all of our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you to our attendees. Mm -hmm.